Okay, hello, my name is Dr. Amanda Seed. I'm a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews in the Department of Psychology. I'm also the director of the Living Link Center to Human Evolution at Edinburgh Zoo, where we study capuchin and squirrel monkeys. And I research um, the origins of cognition. I'm particularly interested in physical cognition, memory, problem solving. And my big question today is, what are the evolutionary origins of abstract thinking? And we might as well start by trying to define what we mean by abstraction. Abstraction is the ability to represent information that's not reducible to concrete surface features, but involves structural, functional, or in some other way, relational information. And it's a big question because it's at the heart of most of intelligent human thinking, whether it's designing a vaccine for an unseen virus, thinking about the structure of the solar system, thinking about social concepts like equality and justice, Thinking in the abstract is, is something that we do when we're at our most intelligent, I guess. And all of these examples involve going beyond the information given and thinking about how things relate to one another. So where does this talent for abstraction come from? That's the, the question I'm going to be asking today. There's no doubt at all that it's heavily influenced by those other uniquely human uh, features of our cognition, things like language, culture, teaching. But most would agree that it's not entirely dependent on those features. It's not entirely dependent, for example, on language. And that's because there's evidence that preverbal infants can recognize these kind of higher order relations already before they're able to talk from looking time studies. So when they're looking at displays, whether it's the, the structure that's embedded in a sequence of stimuli, it's a causal um, display involving object properties that they seem to be capable of uh, and sensitive to these higher order relations. And it's thought that this blessing of abstraction is actually what allows them to learn language so quickly. So for example, if you teach a child the word dog, they'll map that word to the class of animals, perhaps not exactly dogs, but some sort of four-legged furry creature, rather than the exact animal that they have in front of them. So I think this opens the door to asking the question, what are the phylogenetic origins of this ability to think in the abstract? Because humans aren't the only animals that could in principle benefit from the blessing of abstraction. So are non-human animals capable of thinking in the abstract? Um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of different approaches to testing abstraction that have been used in the literature and some of the limitations that have arisen in trying to interpret that data. Um, and I'll raise a couple of further approaches that try to address those uh, critiques and draw a few tentative conclusions. So how can you test abstraction without language? The first approach really stems from thinking about what is the benefit, potential benefit to an animal from abstract thinking, and that involves generalization. If you can learn something in one context and generalize what you've learned to another situation that looks quite different, then for a tool using exam animal, such as a chimpanzee, for example, this could be useful. It allows you to make use of new substrates to gain new objects with tools. And indeed, when primates learn to use tools in the lab, um, solving a problem like choosing an intact tool rather than a broken one, they can generalize that solution to novel examples. Another case in, where, in which it's been tested is looking at more essentialist abstraction rather than causal abstraction. So thinking about the abstract concept of a tree, various different animal species are able to learn from many examples to categorize trees and can generalize them to novel examples. So the question then arises, does this reveal abstract knowledge? Is that what allows that generalization? Or could it be explainable by um, paying attention to particular surface features? And I suppose the issue when you're testing in this kind of naturalistic context is that perhaps evolution has prepared these animals to attend to exactly those perceptual features that do correlate with meaningful information in the real world. So in the case of that broken tool, just attending to a perceptual gap um, or a lack of continuity in the means end situation could allow you to generalize to other cases in which that also holds um, across quite a few differences in other kinds of surface features without an abstract idea of connection being needed. This is what was put forward or concluded by Danny Povanelli in his book Folk Physics for Apes. So he worked with five chimpanzees and indeed found that they could solve lots of different problems and generalize their solutions. Um, across different examples, but when he removed certain perceptual cues, he found that they did not perform so well. So in a trickier example where, for example, you need to pull a rope 
with a banana resting on top of it rather than one with the rope looped around it, their performance wasn't as good. So he suggested that the optics of the situation is what uh, explains the ape's behavior and not an abstract understanding of physical properties. What Silver and colleagues found though is that this kind of influence from perceptual features can also be seen in the choices of adult humans. This data uh, that you can see here showing you know, not complete um, preference for the, the correct solution is from adult humans who will also make these kinds of errors. Not exactly the same pattern of mistakes as the chimpanzees, but a clear evidence of influence from these perceptual features. And something that Josette Call and our students found is that there's another issue with these very tricky fine-grained discriminations, and that's that they may raise other peripheral task demands. Things like the need to attend closely and to remember what you've seen if you remove perceptual cues to contact and connection. Um, so we found that if you compare situations where there's perceptual contact between the, the means and the end, and also situations where you simply occlude for a little while, um, a very clear perceptually uh, demarked example, they, um, they find those two varieties equally difficult. So the, the range of chimps we tested could solve both, but um, they, they showed this influence in both cases. So perhaps once you try to remove perceptual cues, you start to confound the test with these peripheral demands. So one alternative approach that's been taken that perhaps tries to move away from the naturalistic situation to um, something purely arbitrary, that it's very unlikely that evolution has prepared you to detect, is using arbitrary symbols in a kind of touchscreen situation and looking at whether um, subjects can match stimuli based on an abstract relation between symbols rather than on some perceptual property of the symbols themselves. So in, this, in this example that's pictured, it's same and different. So you have two symbols that are the same and you need to match that to the two symbols that are also the same rather than the array where the two symbols differ. And this kind of task has been also been solved by some of our usual suspects, crows, parrots, monkeys, apes, but also pigeons and honeybees. In fact, there's only one animal um, in the ones that are pictured here that's not like the others, and that's the three-year-old. And he's a very smart St. Andrew's three-year-old, but most three-year-olds don't pass this kind of test. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Nevertheless, these, these subjects that do, they may take many thousands of trials to learn it initially, but they can then transfer that solution to new examples where they seem to be mapping this relationship of match the same or match different. It is the case that there is a, a single surface feature that holds between these examples that could be used rather than the relationship between them, and that's entropy. An array that has two symbols that match has less entropy than um, an array that has two symbols that differ. These are more variable. The stimulus is more variable as a whole. And this has been shown to influence the performance of baboons. So this is data from Fleming and colleagues. And what they did is they used richer stimuli. So now you have an array of four symbols. When they're all the same, those four symbols, the entropy is zero. And if all four symbols are different, then entropy is two. And the likelihood to respond different there on the y-axis is one when all four symbols are different and zero when all four symbols are the same. But what was interesting is that they also varied that uh, entropy in more examples. So you can have three symbols that are the same or two. And what you can see is that there's clearly an influence of that entropy. So you get fewer different responses to those um, stimuli, but the curve is not linear. So what these authors argued is you can see the influence of abstract information and you can see the influence of perceptual information. And that was true for the baboons. It was also true for adult humans that participated in a similar test. So again, as with the natural examples, we can see the influence of perceptual features. We can also see that in the behavior of a species that certainly is capable of abstraction. Um, and so we're left at a little bit of um, an impasse. So the problem with this kind of abstract arbitrary symbol matching is that of relevance. How do you know which feature is relevant in this arbitrary matching situation? And this may be a particular problem for those three-year-olds. And equally in the causal essentialist logic of the real world, these two are normally correlated. So this leads to usually useful habits and biases that you may bring to the table when you're, you're doing this kind of test. 
Interestingly, in the case of human children, learning labels for same and different improves performance in these arbitrary matching tasks. And children that succeed in the tasks are usually able to explain their choice using this relational language. So there's a clear relationship in, in humans uh, between performance on the arbitrary matching task and the ability to explicitly reason using abstract labels. Do these labels actually make what we would like to think of as true abstraction possible? Or are they simply solving this problem of relevance? Um, one piece of uh, recent data that um, provides some support for the latter uh, interpretation comes from Cartenson and colleagues who have found that uh, Chinese children are actually much better than um, children in the US at using relational information to solve these matching tasks. And in an ambiguous situation where children from the US will match with an object uh, match if it's available, um, children from China will preferentially take the relational match, match, matching same with same or different with different pair wise. So perhaps it's not purely abstraction that's being tested here, it's also the prior knowledge um, and prior expectations of relevance that you bring to the table, which is influencing performance. So what we'd like to find, I think, in the case of looking at animal um, intelligence is a case where we don't need to pit abstract and superficial against one another, where rather we can look at the use of higher order relations over and above rather than isolation from perceptual cues. So one way in which we've done that is to look at problem solving using the same perceptual features, in one case embedded in their natural causal context and in another in an arbitrary learning context to see if that um, abstract relevance of those features can benefit learning and generalization. And in a second approach, we've also looked at using hierarchical Bayesian modeling to examine learning at multiple levels of abstraction simultaneously using computational models. And that's what I would like to talk about in the special topic lecture uh, later in the summer school. So just to summarize this approach of comparing causal and arbitrary contexts, this is a situation that's been used in infant learning of early learning of concepts or early concept possession by authors such as Spokey and colleagues. So these are sort of classic looking time studies that show that even two month old infants seem to expect certain object properties to hold. So if you roll a ball uh, behind a barrier where a wall has been shown to be present, you remove the barrier, then you'll see the ball resting against the wall as it should in the consistent condition or in an inconsistent condition, it's violated that physical principle and is found behind the wall. And children will look longer at the inconsistent case as if finding that violation of expectation surprising. But that's contrasted with an arbitrary situation that has those same two perceptual endpoints, but in a different context in which the ball is simply being placed. And then the infants don't have any difference in their looking time at those outcomes. So in a problem solving situation, it's not just looking time that's being examined, but choice behavior. And in this example, it's chimpanzees choosing a location to recover a food reward and the rewards are being hidden on a balance beam. So there's a single reward and the chimpanzees show, are shown that it's being hidden in, in one of these two cups on a balance beam. The balance beam tips under the weight of the reward and the chimpanzees were able to select the lower cup um, to find the reward. And in the arbitrary context, everything is very similar, except the balance beam doesn't immediately move and it's later moved a couple of seconds later by the experimenter. And in that case, it's a, an absolute difference. The chimpanzees don't use that differential perceptual information to find the reward, even though it would be 100% predictive if they did. Another example from Josette Call involves inferring the location of food in two cups. And apes are able to use a sound cue to do that. So if you rattle the two cups and one rattles, makes a rattling sound, they can choose that one. And you can use that same rattling sound um, and play it differentially over two cups. So if you hold one cup, and you hear the rattling sound, uh, and then you hold another cup and you hear nothing being played from a speaker um, on the wrist there. The apes did not use that cue. Very few apes were able to use that cue to um, locate the food reward, and there was a significant difference between those conditions. So it seems that embedding these cues in a causal context allows the subjects to make use of their causal relevance in a way that implies they are embedded in a sort of abstract relational way rather than simply being used to make a discrimination through learning. 
And you can actually turn that problem solving on and off through that manipulation. So we did another study with bonobos, capuchin monkeys, chimpanzees, and children. And what we did was, again, it's this broken tool problem. So you need to pull the intact rope to get a reward rather than the broken one. And this, all of them were able to learn. We did this within, uh, within subjects design. So the arbitrary case is, is created by covering the central portion with a lid and there were strings stuck on that lid. So it looks extremely similar, but the discriminatory cue, the break in the string, is not causally relevant to the outcome. And what we found is that even those subjects that began with the causal case and were using that perceptual cue to solve the task, as soon as you covered it over and that cue has no causal relevance, they dropped a chance. So it seems a very clear difference um, from using cues embedded in their causal context as opposed to using exactly the same perceptual feature to make a discrimination in these groups. So what conclusions or big answers can we draw so far? It's difficult because this all or nothing approach to studying abstraction has predominated in the literature and I think it's resulted in a bit of an impasse in the literature about the capacities of non-human animals. Penn, Holyoke and Povanelli have suggested that you can explain what they do based on the perceptual information. There's, there's no need to think that there is any other animal that can think about abstract relational information um, other than humans. In some respects, um, I think in, in these cases, it's ambiguous how we can interpret the data because of the influence of perceptual information. But perceptual information is present in the real world and we shouldn't really expect animals to ignore it when it's normally useful. And indeed the developmental work has shown that children don't succeed in these tests of pure abstraction where the shallow perceptual information is pitted against the abstract relation until they're more like four or five years of age, at least in, in the case of Western children. And there's evidence that learning labels plays a role in that success. And I think that's a really interesting and important start, uh, part of the story of the origins of the human talent for abstraction, but it might not be the whole story. So younger children, non-human primates, show evidence of abstraction where perceptual information is in support, but insufficient on its own to explain the pattern of results. And so the suggestion is that a mental life involving a model of the world that encompasses abstract relational information may not be unique to humans. And then I think you can start to ask some really interesting questions about where does that knowledge come from? How does it develop in other species? What is the representational format that makes that possible? Is it some kind of physical simulation? Is there some sort of language of thought? So in the absence of language, what does that kind of abstraction look like? What concepts can be represented in that format, which cannot? And how does that end up interacting with other aspects of intelligence? In the human case, such as language, so how do labels enhance that ability? Also executive functions, how are they influenced by and how do they influence the capacity for abstraction? So these are the questions that I'm also really fascinated by and I'm looking forward to discussing um, with you this week.